What's up, everyone? I'm Phil Tate checking in for the Nocturnal at the NBC Upfronts, a day highlighting new and returning shows to the NBC family. You want to keep it right here to see what some of these casts had to say about the shows they're a part of this season. Good morning, how are you? Good morning. We're here today. Tell me how important it is in 2020 for this show just to be a part of the NBC lineup. Well, I'm a huge fan of NBC. I was on another NBC show. And for me, uh, you know, I love my character. Amelia is a strong woman. It's an incredibly physical role. Um, she's an incredibly smart woman. But beyond anything, um, She's a cop who's vulnerable, and I felt like what's exciting for me is that, and NBC was really behind me with this, is that I wanted to show Amelia's humanness, and I wanted to show that what makes her strong is that she's full of fear, and she does things anyway. And I think especially in 2020 with women, you know, you have people speaking out, and it, it, it's not because they're fearless, it's because they're afraid, but they know they have to anyway. And I think that is such an important message. Now, New York City is the backdrop for this film. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, these are like real stories, right? When we watch films, it's almost like stories that have happened, happened before. Talk about how viewers are going to almost relate to this film as they've, as they've been in this place, which has had so many controversial stories of, of, of mystery and, and things that have happened. Uh, well, I mean, fortunately, we have the book series by Jeffrey Deaver. So The Bone Collector is based off of the first book, but there are like up to, I think, 14 books in the book series. So each, uh, God willing, we could have other serial killers we track, you know, and within those stories, we also pull other cases that are, you know, New York based serial killers and I think because New York is such a big character in our show anyone watching will get pulled into that you know the, the, the grittiness of New York. Thank you so much and thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. Mr. Russell Hornsby, how are you this morning? I'm doing well and yourself? I'm doing great. I've been such a big fan of your work. I remember being like I want to say in 10 ninth grade maybe watching Lincoln Heights oh, on ABC oh, Family. Okay. You know, you've shared the screen with so many powerful people, Viola Davis, yes. Denzel Washington. Yes. Tell me how all that preparation has prepared you for this role as you now play someone who is paralyzed but is stationary in the show, but still so powerful. You know, when I when I look at all the people that I've worked with in the past, it, 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 it starts with the, the late, great August Wilson. Uh, having been a you know a, a student of his of his work, having worked with him you know personally, having done a great number of his plays, it really taught me uh, about how to bring life and art together. And, and so when you're when you're doing work, I feel like at a high level, and you're learning from some of the best, it can't do anything you know but lift you up. And so when, when I take that the theater work that I'm doing, and then I have an opportunity to work with Viola and Denzel on stage and on screen. What it does, it just improves the actor and the artist and the human being that you are. And so I think really what we're talking about now, where I am in my life, it's not necessarily about the acting anymore. It's about the humanity. It's about who I am as a person, who I am as a man. So it's how does life, excuse me, how does life inform me? So how am I informed from being married? How am I informed of being a father of two? How am I informed from being a, you know, a citizen of, of the world, if you will, being conscious of all that is happening, all the dynamics that are happening around me? So how do you absorb all of that, right? And then use that in your art. And I think that's the most important thing because it's no, it becomes no longer about the acting per se, it's, it becomes about the life pursuit and how you inform that into the work. And we see that in August, August Wilson's The Piano Lesson and so many of his great literary yes. works. And in your theater background, you're constantly in the moment, right? Yes. You talked about putting that work into your acting, but also being present in the moment. Talk about now what viewers can receive, being on that receiving end with this work in 2020, and them saying that this is not just a film, but this is feeding their souls. Well, you know, the, the thing is, I, you, how do you approach the, the material as an individual is very important. 
So, you know, I don't look at uh, the character of, of Lincoln Rhyme as a person with a disability. Uh, I look at him as a person with a disability who has humanity. And so I think that can not help but translate or transfer that energy to the audience. Because again, I approach each character with a sense of purpose, with a sense of duty, and just honesty and truth. And it's, they're, they're, they're not caricatures, they're not archetypes, they're real people. And so, you know, you, I always ask myself, how is this person thinking, how are they living? And, you know, what is it that I can infuse and inform this character? What kind of energy can I give to this character that makes it honest and real? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's like the music we listen to, right? When we talk about listening to R&B, what is it? It's rhythm and blues. Blues comes from... It's inter interchangeable. It's interchangeable. So blues comes from our dynamic of history and how we lived. And so I have to bring who Russell is, Russell's past, you know, the history of who Russell is, where the descendants of who he comes from, and I have to inform that into the work. So when you see this kind of Lincoln, he's got, he, he's got all the, the, the cerebral sensibilities and capabilities, but he's got soul. And I think that's important because that translates differently. So people see a different rhythm, you know. Thanks so much for stopping by, thank you. So you're a Yonkers boy. Am I right? Wow. Um, am I a Yonkers boy? I mean, I went to high school in Yonkers. I was born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, Which part? Uh, Sedwick and Kingsbridge, like the upper, like like uh, North Bronx. Okay, okay. Right before Yonkers, um, and uh, and I was there until I was right into high school, and then we moved to Yonkers, and I did four years there. Yeah, so it's like I mean, yeah, that's definitely my old stomping grounds. You didn't expect that. That no man, nobody asked me about Yonkers. <laughs> the reason why I ask is because I think as storytellers, we have to take some of our history when we go to tell someone else's story, and a part of you speaking about you know acting in this um, series, you're going to tell the story of what goes down in Chicago. As we know, Chicago was highly publicized for a lot of crimes mm -hmm. that happened there. And in your way, it's almost like you're showing a different um, frame of mind as to what Chicago has to offer. Talk to me a little bit about Chicago, the show, and you know, kind of just telling the stories of the people that live there, but, but also showing that they also deserve saving. That is a incredibly astute question. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, one of the things that we're proudest of is we're representing civil service workers and we're representing first responders and we're doing our best to show them in the best possible light. Because every once in a while, you know, you're right, there is a lot of crime in Chicago. There's a lot of unfortunate death in Chicago. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of really honest, wonderful first responders in that city, cops and firefighters alike who are doing the good work and trying their best to keep the community safe. And the fact that we get to kind of highlight that, I think, is a great honor. Um, specifically for me as a firefighter, you know, these guys on PD and med, you don't necessarily want to have a conversation with a cop uh, or a doctor. You don't know what that means. You know, usually when you see a cop coming your way, Maybe it's not the best news, you know. Uh, when you see a firefighter coming your way, usually that means they're coming to help. Uh, and so I feel particularly lucky in that we get to be, uh, I get to be a part of a show where we're representing civil service responders who are just there to help. Um, and as a Latino, specifically, it's a tremendous honor to be able to play a good person who's just out there in the community and you can show the rest of the world that Latinos can be there representing in a good light. Uh, and that's really important to me. So that I think is the luckiest experience I've had. You know, Brooklyn, Bronx and Queens is the inner city, but there are inner cities all across this nation. Talk to me about some of the parallels that you were able to identify, you know, your time in the Bronx, your time in Yonkers, and seeing maybe some similarities between two inner cities but so far away from each other. You know, what's interesting is kind of self-segregation self is a very real thing in communities, and I think we allow ourselves to uh, find our own uh, and just bond with our own. And I think that you see that a lot, whether it be in Spanish Harlem or whether it be down in Bridgeport in Chicago, you see communities just kind of galvanize themselves uh, and come together because they're just familiar with one another. Uh, 
which is, I think, unfortunate. Um, but the brilliant thing about living in these cities, in these big urban centers, is that melting pot is going to happen whether you want it to or not. You're going to come across people of different faiths and different backgrounds, and I think that's essential to humanity. I think the more that we kind of interact and the more that we melt ourselves together, the better we will be as humans. So, you know, it, it, well, while you find yourself in any city, in a situation where you can feel kind of segregated even in this day and age, it does give you an opportunity to come together. And I think that's what all major cities represent. And I think that's what One Chicago represents in a lot of ways. Thanks so much for stopping by. Congratulations on yet Thank another season. Much. Thank you. Tracy, Chicago PD is here. Tell me how excited are you for this season? Um, I'm very excited. It's been an interesting season. Lots of twists and turns along the way. And it's been, it's been, uh, it's been a great time. Get to see Haley goes through some changes, which is interesting. Tell me how important, as you know, you play an officer in this in this series, tell me how important it is for viewers to see the interaction between civilians and those who are cops and seeing that relationship coincide. I think it's very important. I think um, one of the cool things about our show uh, is that we take stories and we tell real life stories that are happening in Chicago right now and I love being a part of that. Um, we don't shy away from difficult stories and, and I think that's a really great, great thing and I love being a part. I love that Rick is like, wants to, wants to be involved in conversations and I think that's great. As we know, Chicago was a place that's been highly publicized for a lot of crime. Tell me why in 2020, as you said, talk a little bit about the importance of that, not just seeing the headlines, but talking about maybe the change and also people seeing first responders and people like the NYPD working to make that place even a safer space in this series, which is not true life. Yeah, I mean, at the end of it, yeah, exactly. Like you said, not true life, it's, it is just a television show, but I think it's just important to just have these conversations be on the table. Um, I think it's important to have all of the all of the um, subjects be out there and have it not be, you know, you have a headline and then it's kind of brushed aside and it's not really talked about anymore. And I love that we take those stories and we bring them forward and it's and it's something that's, that's this is, this is it. We're talking about it, and we're going to have other people talk about everything that's going on. And I think that's, I think that's, as storytellers, I think that's a great thing. Thanks so much for stopping by and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Miss Murkison, how are you this afternoon? I am so good. Thank you. First off, let's just acknowledge I'm standing before a global a Golden Globe winner. Okay, let's just give respect where respect is due. You've been a part of so many riveting shows, holding the fort down, being a staple character in so many works over the years. Tell me at this point in your career, how do, how do you decide which stories you want to be a part of? You know, it, it, when once you start doing a television show, then you're kind of put in that in that world. And I think what I always appreciate are just stories that tell and talk about the human condition. What we do as people, humans, going through what kinds of situations and dealing with this particular show, it's it could be life and death. Um, so I appreciate those sto those stories. Also, and I say this all the time, when you sit down to watch a Dick Wolf production, you sit down to be entertained, but when you get up, you've been entertained, but you've also learned something. You've been educated. So to me, that's the best of television, where you entertain and, and you teach. And so I appreciate doing those kinds of shows. Chicago Med, you know, it highlights what is going on with our health care system in the United States as of present day. There are so many urban hospitals which still do not get the proper services, do not have the proper physicians in there to make sure that leading hospitals can be uh, life-changing for those inhabitants in that community. We just saw Mount Vernon. They're getting ready to close down the only hospital for Mount Vernon residents as of this year. Talk to me about how this show is spreading light on the conditions of urban um, facilities and hospitals. Well, especially for Goodwin, because that's what she's dealing with. She's always dealing with what are the best ways to get the proper health care to the right people, people who are uninsured that come into the hospital, how can we take care of them without, you know, uh, having to send them away or send them to some other uh, location where they won't get the same type of health care. Making sure the doctors are up on, on what they need to know, are current and, and all the medicine that they need to be um, uh, uh, working with. Um, but it, it really is a reflection 
we're trying to tell stories that is a reflection of what's going on in our healthcare system. And again, talking about educating, here's the grand opportunity to bring that to light. Thank you so much for stopping by. I don't have to ask a whole ton of questions. You just summed it up for me. I ain't going to do that. But thank you so much for stopping by and congratulations on yet another season. Thank you. Again. Thank you. It's Retta and Reno. Retta and Reno. Okay. Uh, you were pre med, graduated with sociology. You're. I was not. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> it's all good though. We still here. We still made you guys still made it to television. Y'all, it all still worked out. Good girls. I've been such a big fan since day one. I feel like it's my like nighttime when I don't want to think about anything. When I don't, I don't want to think too hard. I watch the show. I feel like in this show we see the power of the mother. We see the power of what a mother will do to go beyond any extent to save the, her child. Yeah. In your case, your daughter was sick, was sick, correct? Talk to me about the power of the mother and how that's exemplified through this humorous uh, TV series. I think um, parents, you know, and, and, and a mother particularly, they, they don't see barriers when it comes to taking care of their kids or Stealing money. fighting or, or, or committing crimes. <laughs> and um, so I, I think it's just, it just, Obviously, it's heightened because we are committing crimes and getting in very dangerous situations. But it just highlights the fact that a mother will do anything for her child. And while she continues to do her good, de her, her bad deeds for a good cause, y'all going to church for two different reasons. You saying praise the Lord for one reason. She's saying praise the Lord for another. Just tell me, you know, how it's been, you know, just playing this role where you've been in the dark, you know, for so long and slowly and slowly you're learning what she's been up to. Yeah, you know, uh, being a father, a loving father and a, and a, and a doting husband, um, you know, the main thing you care about is taking care of your family and your children. So uh, it's tough. It's tough when, you know, your partner who, you know, you've decided to build this life with is doing some things that uh, you don't necessarily agree with morally. So you got to still take care of your family. So you, you might adjust your morals a little bit. And talk to me a, a little bit about having an African-American couple re represented in this show. I'm loving the raps. I can't front. I definitely love it. <laughs> we're going to spend a little bit for you, a little bit, a little bit. Not every episode, but we're going to spend a little bit. But I love the little, you know, I would say um, salt and pepper of black culture, you know, in, right. this, in this film. Talk to me about the power of that and that being represented in this show. Well, it was important to me that it felt authentic mm -hmm. and... Um, if it's not necessarily written in a certain way, we offer up yes. how we think we would say it. Mm -hmm. uh, were we in the circumstances? Um, like one of the things was, I was like, I have to wrap my head. If I'm doing a bedroom scene or going to bed, so I have much. to wrap my head to go to bed. I love it so much. Um, That's a fact. Uh, one of the things was like, I want to be able to braid. That we were putting, um, our, Lydia was getting braids. So I was like, well, let's do a scene where I'm where she sits on the floor, like when I was little and I had to get my, I get braids and I had to do her hair. Granted, I'm the worst braider, so I was like, oh, please don't let her look so bad, but I was trying, doing my best to uh, braid her hair. I, yeah, we just, we, and, and you know, we, we've had, we have black writers on the show and they'll put their life experiences in it. Like yeah, that. and so, you know, that's why we ended up with the scene about what it's like to grow up black, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the scene with, um, what's his face? The FBI agent uh, yes, that yes, played yes, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bald one? Yeah, I get yeah. so James soft. Yeah. James, James, James what's James? James Turner. Sure. Captain Turner yeah, yeah, yeah. or Agent Turner was yeah, his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we, we you, you know, that was, you know, because we have black women writers on the show who were like, this is what we had to do. We, you know, our parents had to tell our brothers yeah. these things. And, and it's really important for me just being a black man on television and, you know, and being in a, in a marriage for over 20 years and I have two beautiful black children. This is like the favorite, my favorite role I've ever played, you know, and I wanted America in the world to feel some of what that's like. America. Yeah, America, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> to, to feel what that's like and to represent a, a, an authentic black family. Just before you go, can you spit something for me? No, son. no nothing, nothing, nah, son, nothing, nothing, nah, son, nah, son, <laughs> it's all good. Thanks so much for stopping by. Congratulations on yet another season. Thank Thanks so much, <laughs> Mr. Bob Harper. How are you this afternoon? I'm really good. Everyone's been so nice today. <laughs> The Biggest Loser is back, a part of this reboot. I grew up on this show watching for so many seasons. You've been a part of this show for 17 seasons. Seasons. Tell me, what does it mean to you not returning as a trainer, but now returning as the host? It's a whole new job. I mean, I'm approaching this in a completely different way, and what I really like is that uh, it's not 
so much me focused on one team. I get to work with everyone. I do a support group in the show uh, every single week, and uh, it really, it, it was so, it was being able to work out the mind where I used to work out the body so much. That's incredible. Tell me how you were planning on approaching this new season. I remember, you know, um, in earlier seasons, you had to weigh in and scale in and, you know, just talk about the aspects of if those are still going to be there and how you're approaching it differently. Well, um, we definitely still kept the scale. People like to see uh, that weight loss. It's, it's motivational, but we also have so many off the scale victories, too. And, uh, and I think people are really more inspired by that than ever because you're going to be able to tune in, hear a story of one of the contestants that you might relate to that could like motivate you to start to take control of your own life. And I think that um, those things are really great. We're not doing the, the temptations like we used to. We're not doing the, um, uh, we're not doing, sorry, I just blanked. All good. I know. Uh, we're not doing the temptations, but we're also um, not having those vote offs. It's that, that's what I was trying to remember. The vote offs. Uh, before that could have been like a popularity contest test or things like that. It's nothing like that anymore. And I feel like the world has changed when we view, you know, from the early thousands, now we're 2020, can't even believe it. But the views have changed in terms of body image. Now we're celebrating the bodies that we're in. Talk yes. about talk about, you know, not only us loving ourselves, but also us loving ourselves on the scale of being healthy and not just be, of saying we love ourselves and this is the way we are. Yeah, I think that... Um, I'm all for body positivity. I'm all for uh, people that are being the best, the best you that you can possibly be. It's like, I want you to be healthy. I want you to be strong. I want you to be what you want to be. And when you have those realistic goals and you're really taking care of yourself, I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Just feeling good about yourself. Awesome. Thanks so much for stopping by and enjoy the rest of the, of the afternoon. Mr. Hurley, how are you this I'm afternoon? I'm fabulous. How are you? I'm doing great. You've stayed busy from a Seinfeld to Family Feud. I mean, you just are on all the shows, and now you're... Well, that's my goal, is to be on all the shows. That, yeah, that's great. everyone's goal. It's uh, it's rather selfish of me, but uh, my, my job is when I see another actor get a job, I go, how did that happen? How did that happen? Uh, no, I, you know, I just... Uh, it's tough to hit a moving target, let's forget. Um, yeah, this has been uh, this uh, this uh, this right hand turn that I've taken. It's uh, uh, into hosting and uh, and to have two successful dog shows, one on Thanksgiving and uh, and now one in the spring, has been just uh, it's wonderful. It's been uh, just a fun thing to develop and see it grow and evolve every year. Now this dog show that's based in Beverly Hills is returning for yet another season. Tell me what can viewers expect, which is going to be different from seasons before. Well, it's every year. It's it's different because we have two thousand of the best dogs in the country there and they're never the same every year uh, so you're seeing dogs that have performed well during the year in other shows uh, competing for best in show so you never know if that breed is going to be the one that they pick but it's uh, it's exciting uh, every year we try to introduce new breeds when we started this 19 years ago we had 165 breeds that were recognized by the American Kennel Club and now we're up over 200 200 different breeds of dogs right now and each one of them represents a historical form and a historical function that these dogs were bred to do uh, and it's been uh, you know it's wonderful to to go back into history and uh, and see how these dogs really were important for uh, you know uh, because dogs were not pets 4,000 years ago that's right dogs dogs were a necessity for us uh, you know keep, uh, staying alive they were our hunters they were our watchdogs they were they kept the rats away and they uh, you know when it was uh, 32 degrees in the castle they keep your they kept your feet warm that's right <laughs> thank you so much for stopping in by and enjoy the rest of the afternoon thank you Indebted, a brand new show coming to NBC, uh -huh. basically around the theme that you got your parents mismanaged money, and now it's all on you to kind of take care of them. I think that would be anyone's worst nightmare. Just tell me, how was the experience being a part of this show? Oh, uh, unlike the actual experience of having your parents move in, this was a dream. Uh, Fran Drescher and Steven Weber are legends and geniuses, and, and getting to play married with Abby Elliott is, you know, there could be worse ways to come to work every day. That's awesome. And, and have you been finding the humor in this piece saying to yourself, I'm happy and so glad that this is not my life? <laughs> yes. I mean, I had I, I lived with my in-laws for a little bit last year, and it was um, enough of a time to know that I, I never want to do that again. Council of Dads is a brand new show that's coming to NBC. It's almost like a show about friendship, I want to say, stepping in, you know what I mean, when things kind of go haywire um, from I was reading on the synopsis of the show. Just talk to me about how well you think this is going to sit uh, with viewers um, this coming season. 
Well, I, honestly, I think that there's such universal themes inside of it that viewers will, rec you know, will recognize themselves. I think there's a tremendous amount of hope. I mean, obviously, we deal with a difficult topic in that the, the father of this family gets diagnosed with an extreme and difficult cancer. And toward the end of his treatment, he calls together his three best friends and says, if I don't make it, I want you to mentor my children. I think that's universal from the start. I don't know of a parent that runs up against something like that that doesn't go, will my kids be okay? So we start there. But there's a lot of humor in it. These are, these are complex personalities that are trying to help one another and they get in the way, you know, and, and teach one another and they get in the way. So it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, and then they get in the way. And then they get in the way. But you know, they love one another. No, that's incredible. I think that these storylines have to be told because in 2020, we have everything accessible to us, right? We live in a very, like, I society. It's almost like until someone dies is when we all decide that we got to, we feel sorry, we all got to step in. But it starts before then, you know. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, just divulging into your character just to be, to be able to tell your character's story on screen. I read the pilot and I was so in love with Luli Perry. Um, I love her gumption and she's young and, and fearless and you see her face, the diagnosis of her father and you know I, I think we all start off thinking that we're invincible, that oh these are my dreams, nothing's going to stop me and then something happens where the one person you've known your entire life is facing a, a terminal illness. and. What does that change? It changes everything. And so I love the fact that you get to watch someone who is young and has so much to look forward to still deal with the reality that she's not invincible. And I mean, thank God that this is a part of a TV series, you know what I mean? And, and you know, it's, it's that famous quote, you know, life, uh, life is its greatest teacher, you know? Talk to me about uh, why these storylines in just 2020 are just so important to share, because at some point right now, someone's going through that same ordeal. I mean, I, certainly I think we're living in an era where cancer touches everybody, but this isn't a cancer show, actually. I think this is a show about the ways in which people can step up for one another and the ways in which you don't have to be blood to be family. Um, I think a lot of us have had the experience of not fitting well into our biological family for one identity reason or another or just because you just kind of grew up differently, maybe you have a different spirituality, whatever it is. And then you go out into the world and you build your own family. And so the people that by the midpoint of your life you call family, they might not be blood, they might not look like you. but. It doesn't matter because that's the people you choose. And I think in 2020, in this moment, where we feel so much isolation and pain and separation and divisiveness in this country and in this world, to have a show about doing this is, um, I meant to do this, and then my fingers like bounce it's out. It's all good. Me. That's my metaphor for the day. There you go. Thanks so much for stopping by. Congratulations on this season. Much success to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine, we're here at the NBC Upfronts. How are you this afternoon? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. I mean, it's so hard to believe that you were the second African-American editor-in-chief editor of Condé Nast in its 107-year history. Although that's a great achievement for you, it's quite disturbing just hearing only the second. Tell me, how, just reflect on that for a moment for me. Yeah, I mean, when I learned that, I uh, had a mixed reaction to it. I, I, I of course, felt honored to have the opportunity to be in a position of power to help influence change um, and so but I also felt the weight of that responsibility and and um, and you know I it helped me clarify my role to really push for change because for 107 years that means that no one who looks like us had an opportunity to have their voices and their communities and their cultures reflected and um, that's a big problem we and I think as a as a industry fashion has a long way to go in terms of embracing inclusion behind the scenes at the decision making table um, and so to have been a part of changing that to have been a part of that um, in, in some small way is something I do take pride in but we can't take our foot off the gas. And, and I bring that up, you know, because at Teen Vogue, you definitely push the needle towards change. And now you're getting ready to move in now into television, a part of Project Runway. Talk to me a little bit about how you're taking all that training of pushing the needle, making sure that representation, that it matters, not only just for the African-American voice, but for people from all races and of all cultures. Tell me how that's going to be represented this season. Well, listen, so this is my second season on Project Runway. And when I came on board, it was really important as a producer as well on the show to make sure that I was a part of identifying 
um, challenges and talent and, you know, helping to elevate the conversation around diversity and inclusion. It's central to, it's, it's not an afterthought and it's not a nice to do. Um, it's a business imperative. And so it was important to all of us that that was reflected on this new iteration of the show. You know, the, the world has changed so much since Project Runway first came out. And so I'm really proud of being a part of the evolution of the show to make sure that it's in line culturally, tonally, um, with where the industry is now and, and that it reflects the challenges and the nuances of the industry now. Uh, you know, beyond diversity and inclusion, also, you know, fast fashion. We do our flash sale sites, uh, flash flash sales. Uh, flash sales. <laughs> I don't know. I can say that. Um, but as it's, as it relates specifically to inclusion, it's the most diverse group of designers that the show's ever broadcasted. We have um, contestants from all over the world, from Moldova to Korea. We have our first dreamer. Um, we have our oldest uh, Project Runway contestant, contestant um, who honestly has more energy than you and I and the <laughs> Put whole together. cast combined. Um, and so it's really about reflecting not just cultural diversity, but a, a, you know a really broad array of world experience, uh, of lived experiences rather, and uh, different perspectives. And I think that just makes the show richer. It makes the show reflect the audience that's tuning in every single week. It respects them and also. Body size inclusivity is really important to all of us, um, and you'll see that reflected in the broad range of, uh, of models that we have on the show. So it, all, it, fe it feels good to be a part of a show that's progressive. That's awesome. Thanks so much for stopping by. Congratulations on all your success. Thank you. And just keep being that black girl magic. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Tell yes. me how excited you are for this to be premiering this year. I'm super excited. I, we've been working on it since last year, so I'm very excited for everybody to see it. Give me the background, what viewers are going to walk away with after seeing this film. I, well, series. <laughs> I think, I wish it were a film. Um, I think viewers are going to really understand what it's like to have personal contact with other people and bring everyone together through song and music. And I think that we're missing that right now. We are so individual and like away from each other. We're in our phones. We're doing something and we're worried about ourselves that we forget to ask how you are and I think Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist does that. When she hears a heart song she has to ask the person a question, how they are and then really mean it too. I, I think that's what I'm really happy for people to take from it. What did you pull from your own personal experiences, your own life to even bring to this show? Um, my love of music. <laughs> I think that's really, I'm her confidant in I tell her what the song means and what the song is um, and that music is an expression of our deepest wants and desires as a recording artists I literally just sit in my apartment and listen to music all the time and sometimes you just get a visceral reaction you cry you laugh you dance around I think that's what I brought to Mo you know what they say where words stop music speaks you know mm -hmm. tell me who are you listening to a part of your playlist okay <laughs> I'm listening to Ellen Alan Kane, she's Aaron Alan Kane. I can't even speak. I was watching Ellen clips this morning. <laughs> Aaron Alan Kane. I'm listening to Yebba Smith, Lizzo. Oh, I love Yebba. Everybody loves Yebba. I saw Yebba live at a Kirk Franklin concert. She's freaking dope. I almost went to school with Yebba. Did you see her sing Week? Of course I did. I've seen Yebba do everything. Abby backwards. <laughs> and she's on Gumbo Unplugged as well. Yes, she is phenomenal. She is the whitest black girl that I've ever met in my life. Like she is just so black. It's she's it's so good, unghastly. Right? Um, Kirk Franklin, I'm so happy. I listen to him like daily. She was like at his concert, like I was like front row. She was like three rows, um, King's Theater. She was three rows behind. And he was like, yo, ain't you that girl from those videos? And literally <laughs> he pulls her on stage to come say, uh, to come sing uh, Lean On Me. Oh my God, I am here. <laughs> Church girl? I am. Uh, Pentecostal? Oh, I was close. I was close. honey. <laughs> we don't have time to shout. Down south? <laughs> we don't have time to shout. We're just like, okay, gotta go. <laughs> That roast ain't going to eat itself. <laughs> um, no, my mother and father are from Alabama, so yes. Wow. Southern Baptist. Mm. Bible Belt. Tambourine? Uh, yes. <laughs> On a time crunch. On a time crunch. I'm like, we're good. I'm hungry.